Stripping down science. The Naked Scientists. Hello, it's Sunday, August the 28th, and I'm Chris Smith, and this week we're taking you to sunny Scotland, no joke, and the University of Aberdeen, where we'll meet, amongst others, the scientist exploring the deepest part of the Pacific, over seven miles down, to find out what's living there, a woman who can steer yeast cells with an electric current... She's poised to discover how to block yeast infection, so it's important stuff. And the man who's searching for the next generation of blockbuster drugs, but on the seabed. And talking of drugs, to kick us off, here's pharmacologist Professor Ruth Ross, who has successfully weeded out some promising chemicals from the marijuana plant. Cannabis has lots of potentially useful medicinal properties, but it also has potential side effects. So we're trying to crack the issue with making new compounds, new drugs that act in novel, innovative ways such that we can produce effective medicines that lack side effects. So get the good bits, lose the bad bits. Exactly. So most people know that cannabis potentially is effective in things like multiple sclerosis, pain, uh, but it also has the potential side effect of inducing psychosis when people misuse cannabis and take certain types of cannabis that are available on the street. So there's a number of issues there that we're looking into. First, we're looking at making synthetic small molecule drugs, which can actually target the the effects of cannabis and the receptors and mechanisms which make it useful but don't affect the receptors and mechanisms in the brain that will have side effects. The other thing we're looking at is um, understanding more about the pharmacology of cannabis itself and understanding more about the physiology of certain people who react badly to cannabis, particularly teenagers. What actually is cannabis? When we say cannabis, what are the chemicals that are having those effects? Okay, so cannabis contains about 60 different uh, what are called cannabinoids. And initially, until relatively recently, we thought that one particular cannabinoid called THC was the active component. THC produces pain relief, it produces uh, the munchies, and it produces potentially psychosis and mental illness in certain groups of people. But however, the exciting new thing that we're looking into now is the fact that Cannabis contains a number of what what were previously thought to be inert compounds, which in fact do have a whole pharmacology of their own. Um, And in fact, that pharmacology seems to include a number of the beneficial effects but lack the psychoactive side effects. So, for example, cannabidiol uh, seems to have interesting antipsychotic effects, anti-cancer effects, and doesn't cause the high and doesn't cause some of the detrimental side effects. So interestingly, potentially CBD could be a medicine alone, or it could be used as an effective combination with THC. To offset some of the bad effects. So is it it just present at much lower effects, so you see a dominant effect of the THC, the bad effects? So if you put more of that in the mixture, you would negate some of those negative effects whilst still having the, the positive effects of the THC? Partly that, there's certainly a lot of good scientific evidence that THC produces fewer detrimental effects in the presence of CBD. And in fact, interestingly, the cannabis that's available on the street now contains little or no CBD. So skunk cannabis is virtually free of CBD and has high THC and seems to be causing a lot more side effects. However, there's another angle to this, which is, in fact, that CBD has um, beneficial effects and pharmacological effects on its own. So in addition to alleviating some of the side effects, it produces a whole raft of novel pharmacology in its own right. If this substance can have antipsychotic effects, does that mean that then you could try using it in people who have psychosis on its own as a new form of of antipsychotic treatment? Potentially, yes. I mean, we're at the very early stages of understanding the pharmacology. So, for example, one of the areas I'm working on is a new receptor. So drug pharmacology is based around the fact that drugs interact with what are called receptors, in, and these often, in the case of uh, the brain, control neurotransmitter release and signalling. And we're working on a completely new receptor for CBD, and we're at the very early stages of understanding what that does in the brain. 
we will then start to understand potentially how we could manipulate that for therapeutic use. Because in the last few years, scientists have had a go at targeting the, the marijuana munchies, haven't they? There was the drug Ramonabant, mm. which helped to shed 10% of weight. It seemed quite good initially, but then had a number of side effects. Yeah, yeah, that's. A, I'm glad you brought that up. So there's the cannabinoid CB1 receptor, which is located in the hypothalamus, which contains appetite centres. And uh, that was the way in which it was reducing appetite. But, of course, it also hit CB1 receptors all over the brain and affected mood and so on. However, interestingly, what we've discovered is that there are also cannabinoid receptors in, for example, the liver and fat cells, adipocytes and so on, which have what we would call peripheral effects on metabolism. So what we're looking at as a new innovative treatment is making molecules similar to Ramonaban, have blocking the CB1 receptor, but they don't cross the blood-brain barrier, so don't get into the brain. So what we're hoping for these new therapies is they will reduce a lot of the type 2 diabetes symptoms that are associated with obesity, but they won't have the problems of blocking the CB1 receptor and the cannabinoid system in the brain, which is associated with side effects affecting mood and suicidal um, thoughts and so on in certain groups of people. Are you far away? Uh, we've got some nice compounds that look promising in terms of, so that, that's the starting point for a pharmacologist. You work with chemists, you make nice small molecules. They seem to have nice properties in that they, they look like they could be useful as oral, neural therapeutics, but then that, that's where the fun starts with all the kind of clinical trials, raising money to do those studies and so on. So... And it depends how you define close, <laughs> if we're close or not. Ruth Ross. Someone else searching for new drugs is this man, but he isn't looking on the land. My name is Marcel Jaspers. I'm professor of chemistry at Aberdeen University. I run a, a lab called the Marine Biodiscovery Centre. The main work that we focus on is the discovery of new molecules that might have pharmaceutical applications from marine organisms such as sponges, soft corals, sea squirts, and also now bacteria and fungi. Why those species? Initially, the invertebrates, so the sponges and soft corals and sea squirts, are interesting because they have no obvious other means of defense. So we're looking at them because they have a chemical defense system, uh, which acts as an alternative immune system, perhaps. And these compounds tend to be very, very active. Uh, Not only are they active in many assays, many biological tests, They're also much different from the chemical compounds that we found from terrestrial species. And how do they affect an organism that's the prey species or the thing that might be attacking that they're trying to fend off? How do they work physiologically? So there are some very sophisticated ones uh, in terms of mechanism. So a classic one is where uh, it might have something to do with the inhibition of actin polymerization. So it basically stops the the cell being able to divide. That's a classic uh, mechanism that's employed. And in order for the compounds not to be toxic to to the organism itself, uh, they've got modified actin uh, in, say, sponges. You might find that. Um, And also in other other organisms, what you have is that only the the compound has a protective cap on it, essentially, so that when um, the cell is broken open, enzymes are released, and the compound is broken into two, into the active part and the inactive part. It's a very elegant sort of way of, of making sure it doesn't kill itself. And so we're trying to delve into nature's medicine chest by looking at how these species do it and asking, can we copy this? Exactly. So first of all, we, we try and get the compound as sort of an idea of, of how, what nature makes and what it's good for. And at this stage now, we're, we're trying to work on copying the, or, or taking the genes from those organisms and putting them into a, a more easy-to-grow organism. Uh, we've been successful once so far, and we're now trying to make this uh, up to a level where it's actually viable to use because at the beginning the yields are so low that you get one milligram for every 10 liters of culture so what you really need is something that gives grams per liter so it's a big step to go from the small scale to the the big scale you mentioned you're looking at microorganisms as well these are what seabed microbes mostly seabed microbes but also those that grow inside the sponges and soft corals so it's a first of all we started with that so because the the sponge itself is like a giant microbial factory so maybe up to 40% of the sponge is actual um, bacterial biomass or fungal biomass, perhaps. And it is these, it, it's almost like the sponge farms the bacteria for a certain reason, to protect itself, probably. Some might be farmed for food. It's, in cases of sea squirts eating their own bacteria, 
that's a that's a that's a known um, uh, phenomenon. But in, in terms of the sponges, they produce so much interesting chemistry, and, and there are certain bacteria that are always associated with sponges. But they, even one or two miles apart, you might find two sponges with roughly the same bacteria producing different chemistry, and we still don't know why that is. So how do you go from, got a sponge here, there's some bacteria inside yeah. it, with presumably some interesting chemistry going on, how do you extrapolate from that to here's a compound that could have promise in medicine? So first of all, you need to know uh, what your best bets are. So in natural products, the, the things that we look at mainly are cancer, inflammation, infectious diseases, and parasitic diseases. That's where they've been proven to work the best. Most of the drugs that are coming forward through the uh, pipeline are for cancer. Uh, there's painkillers on the market from sea snails, essentially, that, that have been developed. So we're sort of really thinking about how to get from seabed to bedside as people sometimes say. And the answer is really that there's a lot of effort needed to, to go from the small scale, the milligram quantities we can isolate, to the kilogram scales that are needed for clinical trials. But looking at some of these molecules, they are horrendously complicated, aren't they? And they, if you ask a chemist to make them, it's 30 steps, and there's a loss with every step, and they end up with tiny amounts. So is the answer then to say, well, rather than trying to make this in a test tube, we just get the organism to make it for us? Yeah, so that's the reason for looking at bacteria. You can just culture them and you can really grow the bacteria up to a level where you can produce tens of milligrams per litre, which is viable. The two drugs that are produced right now for cancer that are sponge-derived, essentially, are one's a c squared derived one uh, called Exanacidin 743 or Trebectidin. It's a Spanish company called Pharmamar that developed it. They decided to do it a, a hybrid process that so the bacteria produces a certain compound they can modify it chemically, again, in 30 steps or something like that, and it's economically viable because the patient only needs a milligram and a half of treatment. To put that into context, I always say to people, imagine five or six grains of sugar on your hand. That's it, an entire treatment for cancer. In other cases, uh, another compound has been, I think it's 60-step synthesis. And again, they can make gram quantities, but that's, again, it's at the limit of what, what's feasible. So the next step is really to think about using uh, nature's own methods and hijacking those to make the compounds that you want. Is it easy, though, to get a, a species which would be a deep-sea dweller mm. and just culture it? Because it's one thing to take some E. coli, put some genes into it and say, make me insulin, and do it in a massive great fermenter at Guinness factory or something. It's a very different matter to take something which has physiology adapted to survival at the bottom of the ocean. So there's different types of species. So a normal species from a terrestrial environment, if you put it under pressure, it would die at about three, 000, four 4,000 metres deep. Uh, there's other species that can survive down to much deeper. Uh, six, seven, eight thousand meters seems to be the limit again. Um, and there's sort of there's pressure tolerant species, but the species that are really interested are those that only survive at high pressure, and they basically increase in cell mass as you culture them at higher and higher pressures. The problem with those is that you can't collect them easily. You collect them, you have to collect them under pressure, bring them to the surface under pressure, and then isolate the bacteria under pressure. And it's very, very hard to do that. So people tend to do is they tend to have one or two sort of workhorse species that you can work with and then isolate the genes that are of interest and try and clone them into an organism that you can deal with. It's far too hard um, to do the, the culturing under pressure. Have you got some compounds that you're working on now? Yeah, we've got um, some interesting compounds that came from uh, the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest place on Earth. Uh, interesting bacterium called a Dermacoccus abyssii, sort of indicating that it's deep but also unusual because you would normally expect to find a dermococcus in the skin. So it's quite unusual. It is chemically unique. Uh, it produces a, a series of compounds, again, you would normally expect to find. The closest relatives are found in root, uh, roots of, of plants. Uh, but these compounds have activity against um, trypanosomes, which are responsible for African sleeping sickness. So the activity is interesting enough that we're trying now to embark on a synthetic program to make enough of these materials. We have a, a synthesis on the table. We need to now try and develop them to the next level uh, to get them out there and to get people to try them. Aberdeen scientist Marcel Jaspers on the pharmacopoeia sitting on the seafloor. Speaking of which, it's over seven miles down to the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean. The pressure there is more than 1,000 atmospheres. But what's actually down there, if anything, and how can we find out? My name is Alan Jameson, I'm a research fellow at the University of Aberdeen's Ocean Lab and what I primarily work on is the exploration of the deepest points in the ocean 
which is basically made up of the deep subduction trenches around the Pacific Rim. And what we do is we uh, we have designed uh, video cameras and still cameras that can descend through the water column and hit the seafloor, uh, completely unattached and unmanned, and uh, they take uh, uh, footage of, of animals attracted to bait. And they'll do that for up to 24 hours, and at the end of the, the, the experimental period, we send an acoustic command to these systems, and they drop ballast weights and float to the surface, and we download them, uh, see what we what we filmed. Uh, and on top of that, we also have some traps positioned around the bottom of the lander, uh, to catch small scavenging species. And they're dragged up too? Yes, they are, yeah. When you say deep, when you're talking about these sorts of trenches, how deep's deep? Yeah, the trenches we're looking at is, is what's as a biological zone that's called the Hadal Zone, so it's actually deeper than the abyss. The abyss is technically 3,000 to 6,000 metres. What we're looking at is the Hadal Zone, which is 6,000 to 11,000 metres, which is about five to seven miles deep. Just paint a picture of what it looks like. What's, what's it like down there? Dark, <laughs> primarily dark. There's absolutely no solar light influence whatsoever beyond about a thousand meters. So, uh, if there is any light, it's probably biological produced light, bioluminescence. Uh, the trench um, habitat is a kind of characteristic V-shape and cross section. When you see images of trenches in, in journals and, and on TV and stuff like that, they tend to exaggerate the vertical scale. So, when you look at a whole trench, it's probably not quite as steep as you'd imagine. But there are places which we've seen and which we can see on charts that are up to 45, 50 degree slopes. And how much life is down there? Uh, far more than you would think. I think when, when we started this in 2006, uh, there wasn't really much information to go on. Pretty much all the big sampling expeditions happened in the 1950s. It was the Danish Galathea and the Russian Vichas expeditions went out and they did lots of trawling and grabbing all around the Pacific. And since then, nobody really did anything at all. So what we've been trying to do is... Uh, is deploy our camera systems as many different trenches as possible because what we're seeing is similar trends in each trench and and what seems to happen is, is certain species become far more abundant as the deeper you go. So when you go to 10,000 metres, for example, we see more of a, an animal called an amphipod than you'll see anywhere else in the ocean. Are these big creatures or are we at that depth down at the scale of microbes and tiny stuff only? No, no, I wouldn't say they were big creatures, but the amphipods that turn up, I mean, after a couple of hours of filming, we see several thousand in the view of the camera, and they're all maybe between 10, 20 millimetres long. Down to 8,000 metres, we find fish that can be up to 30 centimetres long quite easily. So then uh, we see brittle stars and holothurians and things like that of exactly the same size you would find them off the coast of Scotland. Now, you mentioned that you're, you look at multiple trenches. So... Given that you've got species sitting in the bottom of those trenches and between the trenches you have a ridge of shallower water, organisms cannot spread from the depths of one trench into the next trench because that ridge is in the way. So do you end up with very unique ecosystems down there then in these deep places? Yeah, what you're referring to is what we call abyssal partitioning. It means that the Hadal Zone has been partitioned by often vast thousand kilometre sort of spans of, uh, of abyssal plain. But what's, in some species, what you find is they only seem to exist at the very deep point in one trench, and then you'll find them again at the very deep point in another trench. If you look in between, they're not there. Uh, so there's two explanations for that. One could be the air had a common ancestor that was capable of going shallower, and for some reason the shallow end of the population has since died out. It could be that the, the previous population was capable of traversing across these ridges. And when you recover these animals up, are you able to get clues from working on them how they tolerate those environments that they inhabit under those extraordinary conditions? Yes, it's not quite the line of research we've been doing ourselves, but there's, there's a little bit of work that's going on based on some of our samples, and it does seem to be there's a, uh, been able to cope with high hydrost hydrostatic pressure. I mean, we're talking about up to a ton per square centimetre and very low temperatures, which is normally less than two. So, you know, being able to adapt to these is obviously a prerequisite to survival, so they all do it. Uh, and what we're finding is there's some taxa that doesn't quite make it all the way to the deep and there's some that do quite happily it's on a cellular level of course we're finding differences in the genes as well from the high pressure animals compared to shallow water animals so there's definitely a high pressure adaptation there and apart from the obvious academic interest of exploring in detail an area which has largely been neglected what else are you able to glean from doing this mm -hmm. what's the, the other spin-off from it well our ultimate goal i guess in the future is maybe not at this stage because 
trying to biologically map these trenches is an enormous task. I mean, we think we've done lots and lots of deployments, but if you look at the scale of a trench, you're like, yeah. So, uh, but I mean, ultimately, what, what we were thinking of is, is, is the ocean is, is the ocean. It's the ocean from the top to the bottom. And it's particularly now when we've got a changing environment and things like that. Ocean conservation is, is tend to be, it's a kind of anthropocentric opinion that the deeper you are, the less important it is. But the ocean should be considered as a whole, not just necessarily the depth to which you can dive and take nice photographs. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it, it all plays a big part. And furthermore, the, it seems to be the trenches are playing a fairly major role in carbon cycling as well, because ultimately all the sediment in the deep abyssal plains ends up being subducted back into the Earth's mantle. And if all the, the carbon that's taken up in the surface layer eventually dies, sinks to the bottom, and is consumed and recycled and buried, etc., eventually it will end up in the trenches. So that's a new line of research which is just beginning in, in other institutes. Have you got any evidence that man's activities could impact on that, or are you trying to quantify how important or what sort of contribution it does make to carbon handling? Uh, in terms of carbon handling, I'm not sure. I know that almost certainly man has had an impact at, at those kind of depths. I saw a, an image recently at a conference from uh, Challenger Deep, the deepest place in the world, and one of the first things they found when it got there was a raincoat. I guess that's what they call a water jacket. Aberdeen marine biologist Alan Jameson, whose other claim to fame is having a new species of shrimp named after him. Prinkaxella jamesoni is white and it's about six centimetres long and lives several thousand metres underwater. Alan's a bit bigger, but he does spend quite a bit of time at sea. If you shop online, you probably increasingly find yourself relying on the reviews that other purchasers have posted for certain products. But how do you know who to believe? Thankfully, computer scientist Chris Burnett is online and on the case. What I'm working on at the moment is uh, how we can apply the concept of trust in modern e-commerce settings. So a lot of systems, a lot of interactions these days take place online. More people are buying things online, people are booking hotels online, they're finding partners online. And the concept of trust becomes more important because how do we know we might never meet these people we're buying things from? How do we know anything about them? How do we know if we can trust them? Well, obviously a lot of people do because they're, as you say, spending a lot of money and a lot of time on the internet. That's true. So really, because as you say, more people are spending time on the internet, um, there is a large resource of people who already have experiences. They're writing reviews, they're giving recommendations. And one of the big questions in my field that I'm interested in is how can we tap into those large quantities of, of reviews or, or ratings and, and help people discover services that are right for them. And, and that are reliable? That's right, yeah. I mean, so how are you doing that? At the moment, we're using statistical methods, but really the problem is you need a large base of experiences. You need a lot of people to write reviews and, and give their opinions. If you don't have that, it becomes very difficult. So in new systems, if a new website starts up and lots of people begin to use it, at the beginning, there might not be a lot of... Uh, ratings or previous opinions so in the in those kind of experiences we're really looking at semantic web technologies letting people describe their experiences in a very rich way write reviews that a computer can understand and then uh, and then help them to to parse these large numbers of, of i see so rather than writing a review that means something to me but mm -hmm. which has no parameters a computer can extract any useful information from you're saying you guide people in writing some kind of review or feedback on a resource that a computer can extract value from and then return value to other people when they're asking well what's the use of this or whatever yes. I mean, exactly i mean that's one part of it helping people to to do it but the other the other thing is how can we we need to, to develop languages that computers can understand for people to describe their experiences. We need to, as you said, give people an easy way to describe them in a computer-readable format. Um, and then there's the, the other layer of technologies which we need to help people manage these large numbers of experiences because we don't want to have to read thousands of, of reviews to understand how good a product is. I want to see a rating saying, this is good for you because I, the system, know something about you, the user, and I can say, this is the right product for you. And how are you doing that? At the moment, uh, well, that's an excellent question. The stuff that we're using at the moment is, is essentially, one of the techniques is semantic matchmaking. So if we know something about what makes a good product, um, in your opinion. I know, as a system, I know what constitutes a good product for you. I can then look at the, the large number of uh, ratings that already exist and try and maybe filter out ones that wouldn't apply to you. Maybe if people have different criteria than you have, I can say those reviews are not appropriate for you. And, and so therefore, that's one technique, is to limit the number of, of reviews that people are exposed to. 
So it comes down really to writing some clever computer software that can extract the right information from what's already there. Yes, in, in one way. But there, there are other sort of sources of information. There are Now we have things, we have social networks, people have um, connections, people are using Facebook to, to say that they like this product and their friends might uh, hold their opinions in higher regard. So another question is how can we use social information to, to add weight to certain, um, certain reviews or opinions and reduce the weight to others? But because what works for me might not be appropriate for you. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the filtering question. I mean, there is still the problem that you mentioned of how do we actually compute or how do we arrive at a decision and say this is the one you should go for, this is who you can trust, uh, this person is deceptive, this person is lying. Those are questions that I don't think we have an answer to yet, but we really need to solve them because more things are happening online and I think it's only going to become more important in the future. Chris Burnett from Aberdeen University's Dot Rural Initiative. It's 50 years this year since the drug thalidomide was withdrawn from sale after it was linked to birth defects amongst the babies of pregnant women who used it. But it remains a very effective therapy for a range of diseases, including cancers, myeloma, leprosy and even HIV. Which is why Neil Vargason has been trying to find out how it works in order to produce a safer form of it. We're particularly interested right now in thalidomide and how thalidomide, which is a drug that's given to pregnant ladies in the 50s and 60s to treat morning sickness, how that caused birth defects. And our group at the moment has identified one of the mechanisms by which it does this, which is affecting blood vessels in the early embryo. It prevents them from forming and therefore causes the loss of the tissue so the limb doesn't form. And now we're trying to identify what is the actual molecular target in the embryo that this drug is working on and also trying to make forms of the drug that don't cause birth defect but can still be used to treat patients because at the moment it's used around the world to treat leprosy, multiple myeloma. It's in trial for HIV and cancers, so it's quite a useful drug, but it has this dark side to it as well. If it affects blood vessels, why just the limbs? Ah, that's a good question. Um, And that's a question we, we, we struggle to answer as well, but it turns out that the limb turns out to be one of the last major tissues in the body to form and at the time that morning sickness um, affects ladies um, that's when the limb is the is forming the most it's it's the most rapidly growing tissue Um, so the other organs can be affected and they are affected but the limb is the most affected because that's when it was it's being formed at the time when the drug would be taken by the ladies Um, it turns out that the blood vessels in the limb are quite unique that they are very immature and they're very sustainable, uh, susceptible to being broken down. And so the drug is affecting them, and that's why the limb is always targeted. And that's what we're trying to find out. We're trying to find out what, the, what is the, the gene that's been affected in those cells. Why is it being affected? How is it affected? And can we stop it from being affected in the future? The other conditions you mentioned, leprosy, HIV, multiple myeloma, is it a similar mechanism at play there, or is the drug working in a distinct way to treat those conditions then? The... the, the Thalidomide is, is a unique drug. It has many different actions. It has actions on blood vessels. It has actions on your inflammatory system. Um, it has actions on the immune system. Um, so the actions on leprosy is affecting the inflammatory system, and so that will be different to the effect on blood vessels. Um, and we, d- we don't know what the targets in the inflammatory system are specifically, but we do know that the, if you affect blood vessels in an embryo, um, you're going to get some sort of birth defect. So... We're trying to make a form of the drug that can't do that but can be used to still treat leprosy and so that you don't get the effect or the birth defect occurring. And then, you know, whether we can ever make a form of the drug that you can use for cancer which doesn't cause these things, we don't know yet. But that's, in essence, what we're we're trying to do. It sounds trivial. We're trying to make a version of the drug that just won't do that. But how do you actually approach that? If it was trivial, people would have done it. So it's obviously quite a big problem. Yeah, well... Uh, it's taken 60 years to find out how the drug worked. Um, it, it, it's, we have to make new forms of the drug. So you, the drug is quite complex, and what you do, you, you, pharmacologically, you make new versions, and then you, you test each version, and you find one that does what you want it to do. Um, but because we know that the drug is causing a defect through to affecting blood vessels, we already know we can eradicate those from our screens and just try the, the other forms, and hopefully one of these will give us or several of these, we, we hope, will give us versions that you can use. Where have you got to? We're at the stage where we're screening various compounds right now. So we, I would hope that we'd have some 
uh, candidates soon. But I can't give you a timeline because science is... You say, oh, now I've said that, I've just probably just jinxed myself for the next five years, but, but hopefully soon, yeah. Obviously you can't do this in humans, so how are you measuring the outcomes of, of the, or the impacts of the drug on development? So we use a, a range of systems. We, we use um, uh, embryos, so we use chicken fish embryos. We also use mouse cultures, and we use human cell lines. Um, and these give us all the information we require to, to test a drug. Um, obviously, if, if we do get compounds that we believe could be used in humans, then there would be clinical trials, um, and the whole process will, will have to occur to, to make sure it's safe in humans and, and, and that sort of thing. But we'd never advocate that this drug should ever be taken again during pregnancy. No drug should be taken during pregnancy. But the idea is that it means that if there are people in Africa and South America right now that have got leprosy and they take the drug by mistake when they are pregnant, it means that the chances of having a child with a birth defect are, we hope, lessened. Because this is a really tough one, isn't it? Because it's once bitten, twice shy. And if you come back with a version of thalidomide that, that is very effective but still carries any risk, even though it may be a very tiny one, just can't afford to make that mistake, can we? No, not at all. And <clears throat> I think that um, the fact we've got kids being born around the world today with those problems highlights the issue that we, need to, we, we have to address this. And if we're going to still use thalidomide for its clinical reasons, make sure it's as safe as it possibly can be. Um, so, yes, it's, it's a tough question. But the drug, clinically, is very effective for leprosy and multiple myeloma. The evidence is that for multiple myeloma, it prolongs life by 18 months. So no other drug I'm aware of can do quite that job. So there's pros and cons, and at the moment we're going down the road of, well, if the drug is being used, let's try and make it as safe as possible. And the other benefit, of course, is that they say nature reveals her workings through her mistakes. And we presumably have learned an enormous amount about how normal processes work by when it goes wrong, when something like thalidomide is present? Thalidomide, um, when the disaster occurred between 1958 and 62, changed the way we did everything about drugs. I mean, it opened up new... We didn't realise there were differences between animal models, for example, how the drugs acted. We didn't know um, how to really test drugs properly, and that opened up the whole field of toxicology. And since then, yes, we've, we know so much more about drugs and how they act and why they act, what cell types they affect, some of the signalling pathways... So it, it kind of changed the world. Um, it's a horrible thing to have happened, but it, it, it did change the world. Neil Vargason on the trail of a safe form of thalidomide. And on the subject of limbs and how they can go wrong, here's Martin Collinson. At the moment we're trying to solve the problem of what causes clubfoot. It's a very common human condition. Uh, currently about 1 in 500 babies being born in the UK with clubfoot. Very little idea about what's causing it. Um, there's a mixture of um, causes, probably some genetic, some sort of environmental. We are primarily looking at the genetic side of, of clubfoot, what predisposes people to, to be born with, with this condition. The way we, we've been um, doing it is by look, looking at a, a, a mouse, the, um, a strain of mouse that has been born with club foot for no apparent reason, but it's, it's clearly a genetic um, condition that the mice are carrying, gives them club foot. So we've been trying to look for the gene that causes the club foot in these, in these mice. When you look at a person who has a club foot, what actually is wrong with them anatomically and what's wrong with these mice? Well, what's, what's wrong with people with, with club foot anatomically? You'd think it's a bone problem, but most of the evidence is that really it's not. It's more of a muscular problem. And it's, it's a weakness of the lower leg muscles caused by, we don't know, anything. Um, either direct yeah, a muscle atrophy, some sort of muscular disease, or where, where we're coming from at the moment, a neuromuscular disease. There's actually problems with the nerves, and the, in particular the branch of the sciatic nerve that goes down the, the outer le side of the, of the leg, the perineal nerve, appears to be defective. It's certainly um, a problem in, in our mice model that they, they don't have their, their perineal nerve. Um, is it that the, the muscle is defective and that makes the nerve defective, or the other way around? Well, this is, this is an interesting question. Clearly, from what we, we're seeing, um, the, the nerve is defective, and because the nerve isn't firing, the muscle doesn't develop properly. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the case in all human clubfoot cases. I think whatever um, you do to weaken those muscles will cause a clubfoot, so it can be a, a nervous effect or it can be a muscle effect. Is it on both sides of the body usually, or do they usually just have one limb affected and one normal? 
about half cases are bilateral, both both legs, um, and about the other half, would just one foot will be affected. Slightly more common in males and females as well. Is that not unusual? Because if it's genetic, would you not expect it to be both legs? This is this is one of the problems that we we don't understand. We can't conceptually think of one gene that's going to affect one foot, but but not the other. We don't know of any changes in in how genes are used between between different legs. So how are you trying to grapple with this problem? You've got this mouse mm-hmm. that develops something similar. Yes. How are you taking that forward? Well, we're we're, we're tracking the, the the gene that that's causing or the gene defect that's causing this problem in this mice in these mice. Then what we're going to do is that we're doing this as a collaborative effort with some um, clinicians also at the University of Aberdeen who have been collecting DNA from clubfoot patients for many years. They've got a huge bank of DNA samples. So the idea is that once we have the, the mouse gene, we'll go and sequence all these human samples as well and look for mutations in the same gene. How did you find the genes that might be involved? By breeding mice that have the, the problem with mice that don't have the problem and then, and then looking at all their babies and seeing which ones still have the problem and then checking which bits of DNA from this mix of DNA that the, the mice with, with the problem um, are carrying. So we just do lo- lots and lots of genetic screening for different bits of all the chromosomes, all the DNA of the mice and find which single little bit of DNA is carried with the genetic problem with the club foot every time. And what does this gene do? It appears to be controlling the nerves. So we're getting a gene that um, is responsible for targeting the nerves to the right muscles and the outer side of the lower limbs in the legs. Whether it's allowing those nerves to survive or whether it's telling them to go to the right place, whether it's targeting them correctly, that's the mechanism we're looking for. It's interesting it's just the leg then, isn't it? Yes. And in, in human populations, it's extremely rare to find a club hand there's one family in forest in northeast Scotland somewhere that has club hands, but I mean, otherwise, unless it's a degenerative arthritis type condition, there's nothing similar to club foot in sort of newborn people in the hand. So, if you can work out how this gene is achieving this function, does that also mean there are potentially some spin offs? How you can restore nerve and muscle interactions, how you can strengthen muscles or regenerate nerves, and so on? Clearly, there is, yes. Potentially, we may be able to repair the gene or give some sort of prenatal therapy. Um, the spin-offs are more likely to be in sort of other more clinical areas because clubfoot is treatable. I mean, babies born with clubfoot um, can be casted, and, and most people recover and, and you know, have a fairly normal life. It's about 20% of cases where after the casting, the manipulation, the foot just bounces back and these people need more complicated surgery. We'd like to be able to identify those 20% of people and what it looks like is that it's the people that have this nervous type of club foot that are suffering the relapses. So finding the gene, we may be able to identify those people. And also the gene that's causing the club foot in the mice may or may not be responsible for more conditions in people. There's a whole bunch of sensory motor neuropathies, you know, degenerative diseases in people that affect the lower legs that could be affected by this gene. Martin Collinson. And now from the nerves in your legs to the nerves in your brain and how a deficiency or an excess of vitamin A, otherwise known as retinol, and its derivative retinoic acid, can affect the birth of new nerve cells. But is this true in adults too? Peter McCaffrey. Well, that's why we're interested, because there's so little known about how vitamin A and retinoic acid actually function in the brain. There's a huge amount of work done on the developing brain, so it's relatively well understood how these compounds actually control the patterning and gene expression in the embryonic brain. But it's now beginning to be understood to a greater extent that retinoic acid has an important function in the adult brain. A link with this story is the side effects of a a drug called isotretinoin, which is a a very effective drug used for um, acne. There have been, however, despite its effectiveness, some rather controversial claimed side effects. One is headache. It actually literally makes the brain swell. There's something called pseudotumor cerebri, where excess levels of retinoic acid Or even the vitamin itself, if you have too many carrots, there's some people who have really obsessively taken vitamin A through large amounts of carrot juice, and the brain can literally start to swell and pushes from the back of the eye, and that gives the appearance of a tumour. 
But the more controversial side effects are things like depression and even suicidal depression. And the controversy comes there because the people using isotretinoin are only teenagers who are more likely to have depression or perhaps even suicidal depression. So is it the drug itself that's inducing depression or is it just coincidence that it's this particular age group that's using it? For that to be the case, it's got to be biochemically plausible. Is there any way in which the brain could respond to the presence of an augmented level of vitamin A or, or vitamin A-like agent? Well, that's exactly right. And our work and the uh, studies of others have shown that cells, neurons in the brain, can respond to retinoic acid. Is that because they have a receptor on them, a docking station for the molecule, a bit like you were saying during embryonic development, cells respond to the presence of the chemical and change their behaviour adult cells in the nervous system also have receptors that will respond to the presence of the chemical. That's exactly right. The neurons in the brain express particular receptors that are present in the nucleus and they control the genes that are essential to regulate the cell function. Now there's two areas that we're particularly interested in regarding the brain where we think it has particularly powerful actions. One's the hippocampus and that's an area that's involved in learning and memory and has links with depression. And the other region that we've become particularly interested in lately is a region called the hypothalamus, and that controls the hormones of the body. In the hippocampus, we've got very good evidence that it's involved in a process called neurogenesis. It's been recognized really over the last 10, 15 or so years that new neurons are being born in the hippocampus, and there's been a lot of excitement in this particular area for one reason that new neurons can probably help certain types of memory but also it's been proposed that a decrease in the number of these new neurons can contribute to depression and we've shown that too much retinoic acid at least in the mouse can actually suppress the number of new neurons being born and we've shown that this in fact has a detrimental effect on learning and memory because that's one of the functions of the hippocampus but we would also propose that it may promote depression because of this inhibition of neurogenesis. In the hypothalamus, this is the region that controls the hormone levels, we've been studying this again in animal models and we've been interested in what's called photoperiodicity, and that is the, the changes in the brain and the body that occur between the seasons. We're comparing the effects of the short days that occur in winter with the long days that occur in summer. It's known that there are big changes between those two conditions, and that controls weight gain and energy balance. Animals tend to get fatter going into the summer and leaner into the winter. And the hypothalamus is the brain region that controls that. So we've found that between those two seasons, retinoic acid changes dramatically itself. So there's much more, much more powerful retinoic acid signaling during uh, the periods of summer compared to the short days. So it seems to be an element that regulates the hypothalamus between those two conditions. So if you take a supplement of vitamin A, what is the implication then for the function of your hypothalamus? How does that impact on physiology? If you don't overdo those supplements, you should be fine because the body has this great set of mechanisms. If you get too much of something, it really dampens it down and controls it. But if you really go whole hog and you know take vitamin A supplements and extra carrots and liver, yes, you can push it too far. And the consequences, at least from our studies in animal models, would suggest there would be a dysregulation in the hypothalamus. And this could influence the balance of hormones, in particular the corticosteroids. There's a, an axis called the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis that controls corticosteroids. And that may feed back to the hippocampus result in a shrinkage and possibly result in depression. Peter McCaffrey, so don't overdo the liver. And certainly in my case, that's not going to happen. Yuck, horrible stuff. DNA now. 
And are all genes made equal? In other words, do the protein recipes that they encode all get turned out at the same rates? Surprisingly, the answer's no. And with the help of a mathematician, molecular biologist Ian Stansfield is trying to find out why. Well, we're used to thinking of uh, DNA as the, the book of life and the source of all the information that makes us what we are. Um, what we're interested in is how the information encoded in the DNA is translated into proteins because the things in cells which really do all the catalytic jobs are the proteins themselves and the relative amounts of all the different proteins that are made from each of the genes determines how the cell functions and what its properties are. The basic problem is that you can't simply say if you have one mRNA it will make 10 copies of protein, that each messenger RNA, which is a, a copy of the information in the gene, is capable of producing proteins with differing efficiencies. So gene 1 may have a very efficient mRNA, which produces a lot of protein, whereas genes uh, 2 and 3 may produce messenger RNAs, which are much less efficient at making protein. And we just don't know why. We don't know why. There are some theories. One of the ideas is the idea that when that messenger RNA is interpreted, small particles called ribosomes will move along that messenger RNA, incorporating amino acids, building them up into a long chain, which eventually becomes the protein. And that process is called translation. And the protein is then free to go off and do its job. One theory that we're pursuing is that it is the rate at which those ribosome particles move along the messenger RNA that governs their efficiency at making protein. And the problem is that these are like um, small cars, if you like, moving along a, a road or a track. The, the cars are the ribosomes and the track is the messenger RNA. And these cars can't overtake one another, which means that if one of the ribosomes encounters a site on the messenger RNA where it has to pause, then the other ribosomes will queue up behind it and that will form uh, a traffic jam in a sense, a ribosome traffic jam. And what we believe may be possible is that ribosome traffic jams may govern the relative efficiencies or inefficiencies of an mRNA and its ability to make protein quickly and, and fast. Is this a mistake or is this by intention? Because some organisms use the fact that as they're making proteins, there's this pause which then causes the ribosome to slip a bit and change the message it makes. So is this an accident or is it something which the cell does on purpose? Well, that's an interesting question. What you might assume is that, for the most part, um, these are pauses by intention on purpose because um, evolution has been working a long time to optimise the sequence of messenger RNA. Um, so there is an idea that if pauses are happening, they have some functional consequence. And one idea, which has been around for a little while now, is that pausing halfway through the manufacture of a long string of amino acids, the protein, may enable part of that protein to fold more efficiently before the ribosome then continues progression along the mRNA to complete the synthesis of this long string of amino acids and the rest of the protein. If you look at the ribosome when this pausing is happening, what chemically is making it slow down? Well, the way in which a ribosome works is that it will pause at a particular triplet of bases and wait for something called a transfer RNA to bring in the correct amino acid. Not all of those transfer RNAs are present in equal abundance. Some are quite rare. So when the ribosome encounters a rare one, it has to pause while it fumbles around and selects the right transfer RNA. It's as if I gave you a big sack of white billiard balls and black ones and there are only four or five black ones and thousands of white ones and ask you to pull out a black one but you can only do it by reaching into the bag and pulling out a ball at random. It will take you quite a long time on average to find a black ball because they're so rare. When a ribosome pauses at a rare tRNA the pause will be longer and that will cause the traffic jam queuing of the ribosomes. Ian you've got a mathematician sitting in your office. Why? Well, um, when we were uh, initiating this project a few years ago, um, we realised there was a, a big opportunity here to bring in, if you like, some interdisciplinary expertise to help us and to begin to construct mathematical models of how ribosomes move along uh, a messenger RNA and respond to both the slow and quick codons that we've been discussing. And so we brought in some colleagues from the Department of Physics here in Aberdeen who had the uh, required expertise to develop those rather complicated uh, mathematical models which could then predict for any given messenger RNA how efficiently it would make protein. So my name is Mamen Romano. I work at the physics department at the University of Aberdeen. 
So what we are doing is developing a mathematical model in order to predict how fast the ribosomes move along the mRNA. And what we do is to abstract uh, the biological process in a lattice composed of different sites. And then the ribosomes are represented in our mathematical model as particles that jump from one side of the lattice to the next. This can be described very well by a stochastic process because when one ribosome hops from one side of the lattice to the next, it has to wait for the correct transfer RNA in order to move ahead. And then additionally, we have the exclusion process because if the next side of the lattice, the next codon of the messenger RNA is occupied, then the ribosome or the particle in our model cannot move ahead. It has to wait. And this can produce traffic jams. And does this mean you can now predict ahead? And you can say to Ian, right, OK, yeah. on the basis of you want to make this particular molecule, we would anticipate the following performance of the ribosome under these circumstances. Exactly. Depending on how the configuration of the slow codons, how abundant the corresponding tRNAs are, we can predict how fast this protein is going to be made. And this can be compared to the experimental uh, data that Ian measures in, in his lab. And how is this useful to you, Ian? In what way are you going to apply that data that you then get back? Well, we're interested in asking the question, how efficiently does each mRNA in the cell make protein and whether it can therefore be used as a tool to predict how any cell type will interpret its genome to make a particular population of proteins. This is just the beginning of the story, though, because although the modelling we're doing in collaboration with um, Mammon is helping us to predict the amount of protein that is manufactured from an mRNA, the other half of the story is that as a cell grows, proteins are being turned over, degraded, sent to the, the cellular dustbin at a certain rate as well. And the steady state level of a protein in the cell is both a function of how quickly it's being made and how quickly it's being turned over. What we're doing is hoping to generate models which provide one part of that jigsaw and then integrate it with research that other colleagues are doing to look at how proteins are turned over at particular rates in the cell. Ian Stansfield and Mammon Romano. Finally this week, who would have guessed that yeasts have a better sense of direction than many humans? To explain, here's Alex Brand. Candida albicans costs a lot of money to the UK and uh, in people's personal lives because it's the cause of thrush. But it also kills people in hospital who are undergoing very sophisticated treatments. And clinicians that I meet say that it's a very sad um, experience for them because they manage to save people's lives uh, through very uh, complicated treatments, but then they lose them to this terrible infection. And I'm studying the organism because it penetrates into our tissues and it forms big balls and lesions in our kidneys and our brains and lungs. And then the immune system kicks in and fights it. And the battle between the fungus and the immune system is what kills us. And how are you trying to understand that process and then combat it? Well... Candida albicans grows in two major shapes, rugby ball shapes, and that's how it lives in us as a commensal organism in our gut. If it escapes from our gut and goes into the bloodstream, it gets a signal from the blood itself, and that triggers a complete change in the shape of the organism, and it sends out a long filament known as a hypha. And the long filaments are very sticky, and they contain extra molecules on the surface which allow them to stick to especially small capillaries, like in our kidneys. And interestingly, they also help to form very drug-resistant layers on medical plastics, on catheters and tubes that uh, are put into people in uh, intensive care units. So the hyphae of this organism seem to be a very important point for virulence. If they can't form hyphae, then they can't invade tissues. And then the immune system kicks in, and we can clear them from the blood quite easily. So I'm looking at hyphae. Now, hyphae are very interesting because they always grow in um, a particular direction. And the direction that they grow in is programmed for the specific organism. So, for example, hyphae that grow in wood, in trees, they know the signals that they need to find the nutrients in the tree. Well, in candida albicans, the hyphae have the same kinds of responses built in. They know how to penetrate the surface, and so they get down out of the blood supply and into the tissue underneath. Do we know how they do that? Well, um, we have great difficulty in studying this organism 
in humans. So we've developed some in vitro systems here and we do a lot of live cell imaging so we can watch the hyphae as they grow and we can try and think of ways of making them grow in directions that we want them to grow. So we have two main ways of doing this. First of all, we can microfabricate special little surfaces which have got tiny obstacles in them at the nanometer level. And we can make the fungi grow round obstacles and ask whether they want to always grow in the same direction or whether they want to follow particular shapes. And because we know that when they're adhered to your blood supply, when when they escape into the blood supply, we want to find out whether they are seeing particular cues on the blood vessels and knowing that that is a point of penetration. We don't know the answer to that yet because we have to design the shapes and the obstacles in vitro and then see whether um, if we can make a mutant that doesn't recognise these shapes, do they then cause disease? And so that's one of the things we're doing. The other thing we're doing is we're looking to see whether electric fields might play a part. Electric fields play a big role in wound healing. They act as signals for the growth of new cells to fill the wound. That was shown here in the University of Aberdeen, wasn't it? It was, yes. Min Zhao and Bing Song were the ones who, um, who showed that phenomenon. So we use electric fields because nearly all filamentous fungi grow towards the cathode in an electric field. Now, why this should be, there are several theories, but no one's really come up with an answer. But in fungi, we can delete genes, we can manipulate genes and overexpress them and change their expression. We've now been able to make a mutant which actually grows in the opposite direction. So instead of growing towards the cathode, it now grows grows towards the anode. So now we have to find out exactly how it does this. But because you can easily knock genes out and you can easily label proteins in the cell with fluorescent signals, you can turn the electric field on and off, you can make them try and grow round obstacles or make them grow straight. So now we're beginning to control these things and then uh, hopefully we can find out the, the molecules involved. So we need to know what the signal is how it's sensed, and then we need to know how that is then translated into steering the whole of the hyphal tip round to a new growth direction. So do you know what's making these yeasts grow in the wrong direction yet? Because you can see how you could take that understanding and and just throw drugs at it in order to try and combat this problem in vivo. We don't really need to know how to make cells grow in the wrong direction um, for curing disease. What we need to do in curing disease is to take away control of the hyphal tip from the fungus. Because we've shown that uh, in one mutant, we've got, a mu- we've got a mutant that has very curly tips. So it can't grow in a sustained direction. And if it can't do that then it can't puncture human cells. So what it does is it just grows round and round in a, in a more and more aberrant sort of spiral way, and it means that it just sits on the surface and can't actually go anywhere. If we can find a drug that will remove that kind of control from the hyphal tip, then we won't be killing the organism, but we'll stop it invading tissue. Let's hope so. That's Alex Brand. And that's it for this week. Thank you very much for joining me on my journey to meet some of the brightest minds at Aberdeen University. Next week, the usual crew will be here with a question and answer show tackling your weirdest, wackiest and hardest science questions. So do send them in now to chris at thenakedscientists.com. The Naked Scientists comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC, the Natural Environment Research Council and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at thenakedscientists.com.